I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. So we're going to go through some of the facts and figures relating to where the crime statistics are in Ireland. Uh, but I suppose, you know, before we get into those figures and those percentages, the thing really that stands out for us and maybe anybody who reads a lot or listens to a lot about these people is the same names just keep coming up and up and up. And you're writing there about the son of Fat Andy Connors, who appears to have followed his father into the trade. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it came up. There was, there was a completely separate group of uh, a burglary gang um, recently got um, hefty sentences in the UK in Birmingham. Um, and, you know, like Fat Andy's son, uh, John Connors, also known as Jonathan Slusi, was a, a name he was using in the UK. Um, and, and they're all doing this kind of, what would you say, high intensity burglaries where they go in cars, you know, that they, they don't steal anymore. They buy them yeah. and, and put different plates on them. Um, and they, they're usually pretty quick cars like an Audi RS, this sort of thing. So they can outrun ordinary police who who might mm. come across them. And they just break into houses and, and they do, like they don't do one like and, and leave it for a week. They, they'll do five and six or seven a night. Um, and, and in this case, um, this this particular group who, they're probably the leading figure is a, a character called Darren Joey O'Halloran from Limerick. Mm-hmm. And he got 12 years in Birmingham Crown Court just, just last week. And they had done 54 burglaries in the space of three months um, in, in that area. And it took a huge, I think it was a, a big trawl of CCTV by the local police in Birmingham. And they were able to catch these uh, the cars they were using. And then we were able to link them by going through all the CCTV um, they were very careful, you mm. know, in terms of forensics, you know, they all, they wear secondhand clothing. They don't even use their own clothes. You know, they go to a secondhand store and on the basis that there might be other DNA, I don't know, I guess. This is their trade, essentially. This is their trade. Yeah. And, and what was kind of creepy as well is that the police also released a video um, and you can see them at work and they're so deadpan calm. Mm. Um, like there's one, he, he goes to work on pulling off a, a window with a, with a, a steel crowbar you know, it's a typical PVC double glazing and it's twisting and turning. And one guy is kind of looking behind, you know, he's standing with his back to the house, looking out the driveway, just in case anyone turns up and no bother on them. They work away. And is somebody sleeping in this house, do we know? N- not in this particular one, mm. there wasn't. Um, and, you know, they just go ahead and climb in. And then there's other footage of them inside a house. One guy goes past the camera and another guy shoots upstairs. So they know their little right. areas that they're looking for. And they're caught on, on one, on another clip then with a the safe um, loading into the car, but there is one one video where where they were breaking into a house. Again, you know, not exactly. They were just at the back door, or rather at the front door, just breaking in. Um, and you can actually hear a woman scream, "Get out! Get out!" And they run away. Right. Um. So, you know, in that case, they they, they hadn't. They they were just after getting in the front door. They weren't. It wasn't as if somebody woke up to find them standing at the end of their bed, which obviously would be a lot more terrifying. But the idea, you know. They just go to work. Maybe they're you know. becoming, these are the new generation of the Connors stroke wall gangs that were stalking the country for, you know, a couple of decades ago. Um, and there was a lot of incidents in those days when they were becoming violent to householders who sort of challenged them or woke up or whatever. But possibly I wonder is, are they becoming more forensically aware and far less risk uh, to get in and get out in your secondhand clothes uh, from a, a store without leaving any of the tea. I mean, if you have a struggle or any sort of um, that kind of behaviour with a householder, the likelihood is you're A, going to face a longer sentence if you're caught and B, that you're going to leave an awful lot more evidence behind. Yeah, I mean, if it turns to aggravated burglary, you're, it's a potential life sentence. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a motivational factor, I suppose, to some extent, because they are, they are picking up sentences both here um, and in the UK and further afield, because um, one of one of uh, John Connor's, um, uh, I suppose, accused cohorts, a fellow called Michael McInerney, was recently arrested in Melbourne in Australia, where even though he had been on crime call, you know, yeah. as wanted, he was still able to get into um, into Australia. And I think they arrived in in March. They were arrested um, after about three months. And again, they'd done a series of burglaries in kind of an upmarket part of Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Again, we're using bleach and cleaning products to try and clean up any trace when they searched the house. 
And so now they're, they're, he's accused of that. He's on bail. He, he's also wanted then in, in the UK by the uh, police in Northumbria, as is, uh, as is John Connors. And in that case, what they were doing was they'd actually targeted uh, the owners of Asian restaurants and w- would wait and see who the boss was, put a tracker on their car, and then go and find out where they live and then watch that. And when, when the house is empty, they go in and, and steal the money because they knew a lot of these guys were possibly not, mm-hmm. you know, keeping all their cash on the books. So there, it was a wealthy little seam of, of, I suppose, income for these guys. But again, you know, there was multiple uh, cases like mm. they were, they were, you know, it's not like, the, as I said, you know, they're prolific and that that's what kind of sets them apart from from other gangs, like, you know. So do they profile down to, you talk about them in the videos, they seem to know where they're going once inside the house. Are they uh, organised enough to profile where they're going to break into on a particular night and to maybe profile the inside of the houses, the layouts of them? Which you can obviously do if there's a house for sale and you can go in and look at the pictures and even have a video tour of a house. No, I I think at this stage, they're just so used to it. I mean, most houses are fairly standard yeah. and, and they know exactly where to go. They know everyone's favourite hiding places. I'm sure they're the first to check on the internet for new little gadgets where you can supposedly hide your, your trinkets or your mm-hmm. cash or whatever. So then they know what to look for. Like, un- unfortunately, I had experience of it. Um, I know window was jemmied through and then the internal alarm was smashed. And then, you know, any, any kind of piece of furniture that looked like it might be used for, for keeping anything valuable was jemmied open, whether it was locked or not. The freezer was gone through. Um, were you out of the house at the I, time? Oh, we were on holidays yeah, yeah. at the time. So they had time. And so, yeah, but we figure it, they were in and out because mm. they hit the freezer, they hit a, a dresser, and then they hit um, a couple of drawers upstairs in the main bedroom, and that was it. They were looking for jewellery, they were looking for gold. Um, and the, the the small amount of jewellery was there wasn't worth their time. They didn't even bother taking it. They know it. even from one glance at it whether it's worth it or not. They know exactly yeah. what they're doing and they're, and they're speedy. And it was the second house. Like there was, there was four houses and they broke into two of them. Yeah. And I recall actually my mother's house was broken into similar to that. Was your, she wasn't there, but they were through it like a dose of salts in seconds and pulled the alarm off the wall and all the rest of it. Took nothing but made shit off the back door and, you know, caused a little bit of trauma. But what they were actually looking for, it was Christmas time. And all they wanted apparently was iPhones that people had bought for sa- for presents from They were still on their factory settings and they could, exactly. they wouldn't have to break them or crack them or whatever. Yeah, they could get straight they wanted, into it. That's what they wanted and iPads and things like that that would have been given as gifts uh, for Christmas. And they went around a particular area again, which would have been profiled as family homes, maybe. Um where there would be teenagers with getting those sort of gifts for Christmas. But um, very frightening for householders, though. I know it is. And I mean, it's really uncomfortable. Again, an elderly neighbour one time, um, they called to the door and they were, you know, can you help us? And I said, what's wrong? And they they came back from mass to find that their their house was wide open and somebody had gone through the patio doors and and similarly had, had... you know, ransack the house and cause a lot of damage and, you know, threw bits and pieces all over the place. Um, and again, you know, the alarm, the alarm was on, but mm. it, it wasn't heard by anyone in the area. Um, and they had actually gotten onto the roof uh, out through a bedroom window to take the alarm off the wall to stop it ringing so mm-hmm. they could continue, like, you know, the colleagues. So, I mean, the, there's there's no fear. I mean, CCTV later showed, like, the car where the, the guys had pulled up and spotted where they were going to hit. I realised the house was potentially empty and in they went. And again, in and out, like, you know, and it wasn't... What bothers them? You know, seven in the Cameras, evening. Cameras, alarms, like... I don't, I don't think anything bothers them. Like, people. you know, I, I, I think if, if... I would imagine the only thing that would genuinely give them pause, excuse the pun, would be a dog. That if, you know, if you have, a, you know, a sizable dog that isn't going to, you know, lie on its back and have its belly rubbed, but, you know, is, you know does a loud bark. I mean, it used to be said to me from somebody, you know, a camera at the front and a dog at the back is the best <laughs> deterrent. And that was, you know, and yeah. It can just make such a noise. It can make a racket. noise even if they, they don't necessarily do anything. And now, I'd look, I'm afraid they'd kill the dog. I, it, it is possible. But I mean, only if, if, you know, if you're a particularly wealthy person and there's, I don't know, like a, a munch painting or something in your house that As they're, they're, they're really am. after. You know, if there's something very valuable, yeah. I mean, look, you're not going to stop anyone yeah. breaking in. I mean, you can have all the security you, you want in your house, whether it's, you know, wrought iron gates and cameras and sensor alerts mm. and, you know, and a, a monitoring firm, dogs, you can have all that. But if, if, you know, if a professional gang wants to get in, 
I mean, if they just use brute force and speed, there's not a lot you can do. They can be in and out in 30 seconds, mm. you know, grab what they needed and be gone. I mean, you know, everything from just literally ramming a car in, in into the wall to, to make a hole for someone to get in and then setting fire to that car on the way out just to make sure there's no forensics. I mean, and that's stuff that we have seen in the past. And they must also still have a very, like, I mean, the kinds of things they take. So cash, obviously, is number one thing they want in jewellery. But they have to push that through the legitimate system in order to get their money back from it. They're not going to be sitting out in a market selling this jewellery or whatever. Um, There's people, fences out there working with them. There's no shortage. I mean, gold is just untraceable. Um, Mm. They get, what, probably half the market price for it, I think is the rule of thumb. So, I mean, if you gather up, uh, you know, after a couple of weeks of doing jewellery robberies, you know, anything that's traceable, you're going to get rid of. It's not worth the risk. So, I mean, if there's a particularly unique piece um, that might be worth, you know, a lot of money. It's just going to be scrapped for the for the, the stones and and for the and for the the, the whatever the, yeah. the gold or platinum or whatever it is and melt it down and then that'll be it'll be sold off. And I mean, and it's like we were talking about it recently, but in terms of you know the serious gangsters, it's it's you know it's it's a it's a it's a haven for their money in a sense, yeah. and and gold is universal. Like you can you can use it anywhere. I mean, and, and between using the Halawi system or whatever, like you can sell your gold to someone in in Ireland and collect your dollars in a, another country. You know, not on the other side of the world. They have to know these guys are doing what they're doing. When you come in, somebody comes in with a collection of other people's jewelry. Like, um, they must the buyers must realize where they're getting it from. They must be facilitating that market. It seems like almost hard work what they're doing compared to, you know, the drug dealers. Yeah, but I, I think there's an element of a buzz about it for these guys. I mean, we saw that with Fat Andy. Like, you know, the guy was a multimillionaire, owned, mm. you know, large amounts of property, and he's still caught creeping around back gardens with a, you know, a chisel and a screwdriver in his hands. Like, he wasn't doing it for the money. Mm. He, you know, he, he was like a guy who just couldn't retire from playing football or rugby when he should have, like, you know, years before, and let the young lads get on with it, but still, you know, enjoyed the thrill of creeping around. And, and wasn't that even Martin, the General Cahill was supposed to be yeah. what they call a creeper, you know, specialised in, you know, quite enjoyed breaking into people's homes, knowing that there was somebody in there and not waking them up or alerting them. And is that a kind of a two-pronged thing with them? They get the buzz out of it, but it's also an attack on ordered society who maybe would have, they would see as having had better privileged kind of lifestyles than them. I, I think, I, I, I wouldn't, I doubt they're thinking that deeply about it. I know, I know from our point of view, we would see it as that way. It's a mm. terrible attack on polite society yeah. and the likes of us. But I, I definitely would be used, like, I mean, you've, you've probably heard it from people that you've spoken to um, over the years. I certainly have. But people kind of say, oh, well, look, we only stole from the big houses in Black Rock. I mean, they can afford it or Fox Rock or wherever. And, and it's very much kind of, uh, they're justifying, oh, these people can afford it, you know. And, and it's, it's trying to justify what you're doing in your own head, no more than Christy Kinahan Sr. probably thinks he's a, an international broker and not a drug dealer. You know, you, you can, you'll always find a way to justify, you know, what you do. And, and we saw that with the, the funeral of the, those, the guys that were killed on the N7, yeah. you know, and again, which is all the example of the crazy driving, uh, you know, and burnt to death, but they were celebrated. Um, and, and what they did for a living, which is exactly what we're talking about, was celebrated by, you know, a lot of people who knew them. And so, you, you know, it's, they see themselves as Robin Hoods, as hardworking Robin Hoods. And it's hard to argue against the fact that they're not hardworking because they're absolutely prolific. Well, that's what I mean. It, it does seem like hard work having to actually, you know, physically bring yourself into a new country, profile what you're going to do, the nights and nights of work uh, up late, I suppose, in the early hours of the morning and whatever other times they're out at. What strikes me is, though, is it a dying trade? Because we're becoming more and more, I mean, I would never have cash in my home. I'd be lucky if I have enough cash to pay somebody who wants cash. In actual fact, if you're trying to pay someone who wants cash, you often find yourself at numerous bank machines because there's no cash in the bloody things, especially after the weekend. Um, I don't know, do we have the same value on, you know, high-end furniture and jewellery as we used to? I think things of times have changed. No, I, I think there is. No, there's still a market for jewellery. I mean, uh, people like their bling, you know, especially, yeah. you know, and, and it's across the board. It's not any particular demographic. You know, there's plenty of people like showing off their big sparkler, they get engaged or, you know, and, and it's, and there's plenty of people like their gold and, and some, some people, 
you know, they will buy a Rolex or whatever, knowing that, you know, they might only wear it once a year mm-hmm. um, and very carefully wear it and keep it in the box, knowing that it's an investment and that, you know, whatever the, the 15 grand they might have spent on a Rolex or the 20 grand or whatever, that in, in a couple of years time could be worth, you know, substantially more. It's an investment. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there, it's still out there and not everybody is necessarily going to, you know, think, oh, well, I, I won't get hit. I'll hide it here. They won't think of looking there. Um you know, and it's the same with gold. Like people are, are are buying gold, and you know, it's a fad on you know on the internet. You have all these kind of uh, gurus, financial gurus, saying, "Oh, you've got to get you know physical mm-hmm. gold," and people are, are probably buying that, you know, and stuffing it under the bed. And you know, after a while, you know, they might have a substantial amount. I mean, whatever it is, an ounce is whatever it is. I don't know between twelve hundred or fifteen hundred dollars. So you can you can store a lot of a lot of wealth in a small physical you know piece of gold, which. Even if you're even if you're someone in legitimate business who's maybe trying to, you know, uh, gently avoid a little bit of tax, it might be a way of doing it. Or you're trying to hide it from your husband or hide it from your wife. And identifying you know? some of these designer goods, including, well, particularly handbags, which can be worth thousands. And uh, somebody was only pointing out to me recently that I'll say Europe wide, the amount of secondhand stores now selling pre-used designer handbags is quite extraordinary. Um is there really that many people who are, you know, going out buying them and with legitimate earnings and then just getting fed up of them after a season and throwing them into a secondhand store? Anyway, it's interesting. It seems to be a growing market. Um, to get on, I suppose, to the kind of where are we at at the moment with crime? Obviously, the interesting headline recently was there's been no gangland murders in the past year. Um, I would say just throwing it out you know, it, there has to be something in the fact that an awful lot of hit men are locked up at the moment. Um, and is there a never ending amount of people out there who are willing to, uh, I'm not saying they're all locked up, but I do think a lot of them, a lot of the hit teams, a lot of the prolific hit men are locked up. Um, Certainly some of the most volatile ones yeah. know, are, are locked up at the minute. You know, the, the ones who would have no qualms about doing it, mm. you know, and, and crazy enough to take risks. Um is that anything to do with it, do you think? Or is it just there is there just a calm? I mean, look, we often see a rise in 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 feuding. You'll have a year on the Sunday world when you be just seem to be never ending writing about gangland murders. You can't believe there's another one. And then it does it does settle down. It seems to be a lot of that sort of that world seems to operate like a roller coaster. Well, I mean, if you look at at, I suppose the worst gangland feuds that would have happened in Ireland, like you know, in Limerick, the Crumla, Crumlin Drimna feud and the Hutch Kinnahan feud, they were incredibly bad for business for the gangs involved. Mm. Um, and like an, that story that that got recently from the Criminal Assets Bureau, uh, you know, in terms of the 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 motor dealership that was set up to loan the money, mm-hmm. that showed you how both sides, you know, of, of you know previously sworn enemies now had a little, you know, board of governors, board yeah. of directors that were were pretty much sorting things out. So they were getting down to business, and I mean, and in the scale of it, you know, like the Limerick gangs with their international connections and you know with their ability to deal drugs in you know, wherever I suppose in in Munster and and some some of the west of Ireland. They're, they're no way are they even the biggest in Ireland. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're probably, I, I don't know where they are, but they're probably, if, I, if I've said they were sixth or seventh or eighth, I, you know, I'd be, I think a little bit generous when you consider who else is out there. Um, but I mean, they've just got on with it and got on with business. And I'd say, you know, the whole Kinahan feud, like has, as we know, has put away so many serious gangsters, so many dangerous people that I think those who've come after are thinking about, let's just make the money, keep the heads down. You know, and if somebody is going to have a go at me, you walk away, you find a new place to do business or something like that. I mean, and you know, with the, with the Gucci gang and the stuff that's happening in Fingless, I mean, that's a couple of young hotheads. Again, they're, they're way down to some extent. They're a good bit down in, in, in the scheme of things. You know, they're not the guys. And people with sense maybe, and there are plenty of people with sense in the drugs trade, will look at it and realise oh my God, we don't want to go down that road again, which was the Kinahan Hutch feud was such a kind of a volatile explosion of violence that, you know, didn't end up having any good ending for anybody in the, you know, and particularly the businesses. They, you're talking about the, within the, um, the growth of the drugs trade and the statistics that we have available to us that Ireland's drug market potentially being worth over 1 billion. Yeah, I was trying to work this out yesterday, um, mm. and they were talking about uh, there, there was a figure of nine billion uh, for the cocaine market in Europe alone. Yeah, and then 
I was kind I think of. They've I, had kind of even up that. Yeah, and and yeah. They're, they're talking about thirteen nine, between nine and thirteen billion was yeah. the kind of figure that they were they were throwing around. I mean, again, it's it's hard to you know nobody's keeping receipts and, and yeah. sending their stats into the Department of Health or whatever. Um, so like I was trying to work it out. Um, so in in twenty twenty one there was one hundred and ten million worth of drug seized, and it was forty six million in twenty twenty two, and of course that figure can be skewed. Uh, by you know a major seizure like whatever it was sixty kilos uh, yeah. uh, you know offshore you can have one and, massive big one yeah and it totally skews position. it yeah and and so and and generally the, I remember it was a United Nations figure at one one point they came out that you know seizures represent between five and ten percent of mm-hmm. of the market so presuming that you know say forty six million or a little bit more than that is you know destined on a yearly basis to the Irish market at the moment would put you know, the, the Irish drugs market potentially into the billion euro, which kind of sounds like a lot, but we're at the top of all the, mm. the drug taking leagues. We're at the top for, um, I think, overdotes from certain drugs. But that's only the South. Yes. <laughs> so you know what I mean? There's yeah. another, like, statistically, you could say, you know, it's whatever you got percentage. Add on, and, and on again, of... yeah, yeah. And, and it's hard to know because, I mean, you, you have some of the big seizures here, um, you know, some of that, could be destined for the UK. For, for the North or for the UK, or it could be the other way around that some of the stuff that's seized in the UK is actually destined for here. So it may work out. Um, yeah. I imagine the traffic, it's going to come in both directions in Ireland. Some of it's going to be coming via via the, the Netherlands and Belgian ports back through the UK. Mm-hmm. And then some of it has arrived on the Irish coast and is, is heading the other direction. So, And what sort of other crimes are covered in the statistics? What, where are we at? How are we doing with our fraud? And... Um, well, surprisingly enough, one of them where there was a decrease, despite all the recent headlines, was was assaults. So, you know, as we were talking about before, yeah. like, you know, when people are getting attacked on Tauber Street, we're saying, well, do you know what? It's not that unusual when you're, when you're used to the place. And, you know, why, you know, and one made a headline because it was a, an American citizen and, you know, he was mm-hmm. seriously injured. But, you know, there's so much of that kind of activity goes on in, in certain parts of, of certain cities all over Ireland all the time. That is not unusual. So the number the, the numbers are actually down. Um, it even, wasn't yeah. out of control as, as no. a lot of politicians. No, were. but but there is. I mean, look, look I mean, things like um, theft and those related offences they were up by twenty seven percent, something like seventy one thousand. It says here, and that's in including the last tra- your burglary stuff. And yeah, it would be. Um, and and. You have then like fraud is down, but that's again because there's been success ag- against kind of the money mules u- using their you know bank accounts of yeah. you know innocent people or or dupes or whatever you want to call them or allowing their bank accounts be used. So I mean that, that that's a particular, I suppose, slowdown at the minute, but which is likely to to kick off again. Mm-hmm, like, you know, mm-hmm. and I mean, do these statistics ever really? I don't really like statistics, by the way. Well, I mean, I know. clearly I'm not great. Well, journalists and statistics figures. have a really bad record together. They certainly <laughs> do. But I always kind of feel from knowing a little bit about the workings of the Garda Síochána that they are a statistics sort of based organisation. And sometimes if there's political, uh, you know, outcry over something like assaults, they will actually push the policing into the area of street assaults or whatever. And they do the same sometimes with the drug situation, you know, they will send out armies of Gardaí to lift a load of street dealers when the bigger problem is up here. But they are, and they're a very kind of reactive organisation, I think. Yeah, we, we saw that after the, the recent headlines, you know, between the Temple Bar assaults and the Talbot Street assault, where, you know, it was a very unusual kind of series of, of press releases where they were telling us how many people had been arrested in the Dublin area over the weekend, yeah. uh, whatever what the numbers were, like 89 or I, mm. I forget exactly. And it was very much trying to make the point, look, this is what we do all the time and this is how many people arrest and we are on the street and, you know, and there are people being put in handcuffs and mm-hmm. they were trying to counter the narrative, you know, from people on the street who are living in Toba Street or Temple Bar or wherever. Um, and they're saying, you know, I never see a guard on the beat. I don't see anything happening. But I mean, you, you know, the guards could be past your house five times in a night and you wouldn't know it. So, I mean, you, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a very, it's an unscientific kind of, um, I suppose, way of, of, of criticizing the guards for, you know, if you feel that they're not doing a good job in your area, it's it's not, it doesn't necessarily stand up to scrutiny. Mm. And I think they were putting out these emails that kind of, to make that point. But as you say, like, it, it does seem a bit reactionary. They do tend to be. And, and of course, the statistics also, because they take a while to count up and to, to put together. 
And, and the whole science uh, around uh, it. They were late to maybe sometimes a few years ago yeah. and things have changed by the time they actually come out. And um, it, the actual, the stats on the CSO, on the um, st Central Statistics Office yeah. come with a health warning. Right. Like, you know, because if you remember, there was a row a couple of years back where the CSO were saying, you know, the way the guards collect their stats isn't really up to up to standard. And, and they're still holding to that line. I mean, it, it, it does come with a, with a health warning. But there's one other, before, we, <laughs> before I forget, um, while gangland, you know, mm. the last gangland murder was, in, was the 5th of December last year, but there's been a 31% uh, increase in the number of homicides. So it's gone from 24 to 47. So this would be domestics yeah. and, you it's know, whatever. It is yeah. a lot. It is, yeah. it is high. Because I remember, like in the past, I mean, 20 plus years ago, it was kind of average about 20, 25 murders a year and then it kind of I don't think uh, 47 I think it might have hit that once somewhere around 2008 or something like and that and that's all that you can remember that far back and it was that rare and was there any reason what, why it's gone up yeah well if, who knows I mean if, if you're looking at the, the if if drugs have gone up 19% in Population, terms of personal of course, maybe that's got that's to do with covered, it is it I presume, yeah. Well, it's 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 not um, murders per head. So I mean, yeah. I mean, there is an increase, but yeah, exactly. the, the population hasn't doubled from you know twenty four yeah. to forty seven is effectively a doubling. Yeah. So we, you know, whatever po population increase, that doesn't account for it. You'd wonder how what that's about. Is there any sort of copycat or, you know, there's been a lot of outcry about domestic violence against women and. Um, that, why that might be that, that has been um, like I mean like domestic violence is definitely part of it we see that in, in some of the, the, the killings mental health is, yeah. is a big issue um, I mean and, and there's been a lot of publicity about you know the failure of mental health services in Ireland to get to grips you know people not getting treated quickly enough especially young people um, and then, you know, with the extra use in drugs, I, th I think there's probably a, a little bit of the lid is off now after, mm -hmm. you know, the two years of COVID lockdown. Um, you know, I'd, I'd say there's a lot of different factors at play. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's one single thing. And do those crime statistics, those uh, murders, the homicides there for which year? It's for the 12, the 12 months previous to the, the end of June this year. So it's, it's the it's, it's the Q three yeah. it's the Q three figures. It's the oh, sorry, yeah, it's the Q two figures. The quarter, so. the second mm. quarter figures. Yeah, and and again, like kind of uh, some of the increases, say you know, in assaults, could be down to that. The fact that everyone was was locked down, so that's why you can sometimes get a, you know, yeah. an, an anomaly. Takes, in, in, you see, in it does things. take a few years for sort of people with bigger brains than I have anyway to come up with the reasons why some of these figures are so you know skewed or so different or so raised or whatever. Um, I wanted to ask you finally, because you started on it, why is the UK police doing a better job in the burglary gangs? Have we not had they seem, much success? They, they seem to, um, <coughs> they've definitely got longer sentences. I mean, you're talking yeah. about 10 and 12 years. Um, John Connors uh, got three and a half years, um, uh, I think last year, you know, caught with housebreaking implements uh, after a chase in which a guard car was rammed. And he's a long list of, of previous are they being actively investigated in the UK as in are the police profiling them in the same way they're profiling? Are they or are they kind of picking them up by accident? And I think when they realize that there's a pattern and there's a professional gang, they mm. get the they get the nod from above. They get the resources needed. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the. You know, I, I imagine it's it's a great feather than the cap of any senior detective, you know, to be able to say they 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 stopped a, a dangerous professional burglary gang in their tracks who'd carried out 54 burglaries in the yeah. case of uh, O'Halloran. You know, I mean, like O'Halloran was, was I mean, he, he must have only been out of prison from Limerick about two years when he was uh, carrying out these raids in Birmingham. He was done for um, threatening to kill a guard and burn his house down and even mentioned the colour of his house mm -hmm. in a very specific threat. And his brother Aaron, you know, was the subject of a, a kind of a, a you know, a monster-wide manhunt at one stage after, you know, another, you know, crazy reckless drive across the country after breaking into houses in Waterford. And, you know, um, and I think a guard was injured in Cork on his way back to Limerick. So, I mean, it's all, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it, 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 look, I mean, we've ha we have had specialist um, operations against burglary gangs in, in Ireland, um, I, I think, 
I forget the name of it now, but you often hear every time then a burglar was caught, it was under Operation... Operation Tara, is it not? I, I can't remember it yeah. off the top of my head at um, the minute. But, I could be wrong but, with that myself, but, but I, you know, I do, I do know that we have had a huge amount of resources put into the burglar gangs, but maybe a little bit like the street dealers, you put the resources in here and they start doing it in the UK and they move to different jurisdictions yeah. to kind of keep... And, and it's, it's quite possible that's why they're in Melbourne, the States, yeah. you know, the, the US and the UK, because the pressure was too much for them here. So, yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's you can only like I mean we, we should really take it as a sign of uh, the success of the guards yeah. and their operation against these gangs that they've had to to move on to other jurisdictions that it just got too hot for them here. Okay, um, well <clears throat> it's all a bit grim, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> keep your doors locked is all we can say, and and keep your dogs barking. Yeah, I, but you, you can over. I, th- I do think people can you can overstate it. Like yeah. you know, and I mean. Like, think about how many burglaries there actually have been on your street and, you know, they think, oh, that's terrible. But it probably happened eight years ago and it happened once. So, I mean, you know, people need to keep it in perspective. But mm-hmm. at the same time, keep your dog barking and your exactly. doors locked. <laughs> exactly. Thanks, Eamon Dillon. Thanks, Nicola.